Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation of Cunningers Presents, featuring the Parker Electromechanical Division and their electric cylinder offering. I'm your host, Paul Cunninger. You should see a picture of me there. And in a moment, we'll be joined with Adam Thomas from Parker, who will walk us through the electric cylinder offering. We've placed everybody on mute so if you have a question during the presentation, uh, please use the chat feature in the GoTo Training uh, control panel, which should be on the right side of your screen. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat and we'll answer your questions during the presentation as we can. And then there's also time allotted at the end for other questions. If after the presentation, you still have questions, I'll ask you to reach out to your Cundinger contacts and you can do that via uh, contact information that you may already have for them, or you can email us at sales at .com, or just call our office at 1-800-242-4811. While we are covering the electric cylinder offering today, our team is ready to work with you to develop the best solution for your application and offer you options, whether it be hydraulic, pneumatic, or electric. We have uh, an extent offering in all those three technologies and believe that it's very beneficial that we can work with you to try and develop this solution that is going to work best. And having options is better for all of us. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on our Cundinger Inc. YouTube channel for future review and to share with your colleagues. We also have out there previous presentations that we've done, and those are also available for you to review. And we welcome the opportunity to cover any of that content in person or virtual with you and your team. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam to take us through the rest of today's presentation. Making you the. All righty, Tom. One second to make sure that uh, screen share is working here. Paul, are you guys able to see? I see your screen. It's in presenter mode right now. Okay. One second. How about that? That's good. All righty. Well, good morning, everybody. Like Paul said, today we will be going over the uh, electric cylinder offerings from Parker. 90% um, of this presentation will be on uh, sort of our flagship product uh, in this space called the ETH. We'll touch a little bit on uh, another product known as the XFC that we kind of uh, reserve for uh, some sort of niche applications where uh, some higher forces or some higher type loads are required. So we'll go through a quick introduction to the product, some of the design features, uh, and sort of an overview of what kind of performance you can expect. Uh, we'll go through some of the uh, part number configurations and a lot of the different options that are available with this unit. I will also go over some uh, quick ideas on sizing, mainly what sort of information do you need to know for me to be able to select one of these products and help you uh, make sure that everything is sized adequately. We'll go over some typical markets and applications and uh, as well as some other, like I mentioned, some other uh, extensions of these product lines. So the ETH series, uh, ETH stands for electric thrust high. This is a uh, sort of a next generation product of our sort of legacy product uh, in the space which was called the ET, just for electric thrust. Um, this is not just a repackage type of product. This, unit was designed pretty much from the ground up utilizing the technologies uh, available today. This is an integrated drive train and guidance design, uh, meaning we're able to keep things in a little bit of a smaller package and uh, save a little bit of cost by incorporating uh, making components kind of pull double duty. We use utilize oversized ball screws and thrust bearings on these uh, types of units, meaning we're able to get much higher thrust density out of the ETH than a lot of other similarly sized uh, products on the market. 
And again, this is extremely high force density compared to traditional ball screw type designs. And we're even competing with a lot of roller screw type products with this product. So uh, most electromechanical actuators and pneumatic actuators all sort of based around the same sort of body, an extruded aluminum cylinder body. It's a smooth, uh, smooth body surface, meaning uh, simplified cleaning. We don't have a lot of uh, crevices and cavities on the surface, which can be really helpful in uh, food and beverage, pharma type applications. Oops, sorry. Uh, they're the one uh, type of uh, crevice that is on the actuator are the grooves uh, for limit switches. So for the uh, on on two units, they'll be located on two sides. On some of the larger units, they will be located on all four sides. This is going to utilize the same uh, global Parker limit switch uh, that is used on pneumatics and hydraulics. So if you're familiar with any of those, pretty much identical here. Uh, these do mount flush with the body so if you're in a tight sort of space constraint you don't need to worry about the limit switch sticking out on the other side and those slot covers uh, are hollow underneath allowing for easy cable routing so as for how this works uh, most cylinders you know these aren't necessarily going to be that high speed uh high guide high uh side load type applications not really what you're looking for when you're looking for an electric cylinder so the uh, guidance type options are sort of simplified to what we would call a glider bushing. So these are sort of lubricant impregnated polymer uh, bushings that will ride on directly on the cylinder bore. So no, uh, just as extruded and as anodized, no additional machining is needed, which could add a good bit of cost. Uh, support bearing, we said hardened polymer bushing. It does eliminate vibration and uh, play in the cylinder rod, reduces noise uh, quite a bit. And though these things aren't necessarily designed for uh, high side load type capabilities, uh, this type of design does give us some pretty high side load capability for a product like this. Drive trains, we mentioned these are ball screws. It is a class uh, seven or a C7 type uh, precision in air quotes ball screw, still not as precise as uh, like a C5 ground type screw, uh, but quite a bit uh, less uh, expensive than a screw like that. And then a lot of these, again, these electric thrust type applications, we're not looking for repeatability on a single micron kind of level. This, uh, that screw might look a little, uh, a little strange to some of you who are familiar with ball screws. That is because this is a proprietary uh, screw to us. We don't manufacture the screw, but uh, we did design it. We do outsource the manufacturer just to keep the, uh, keep the cost down as much as we can. Uh, but it is a proprietary unit with a patented ball return, meaning we're able to basically get a uh, uh, what's called a double ball nut in there. We'll have sort of typically double the amount of rollers, uh, rolling elements in that screw than you would see in, in a traditional screw of the same sort of size. And the patented ball returns, uh, the way they're integrated, means we don't need to add any additional diameter or length to that nut. And what that allows us to do is take the same sort of ISO size bore that all that every cylinder in this market is going to be based around and sort of maximize the diameter of the screw itself, meaning we're able to get higher thrust and higher speed in the same sort of package size. So again, I mentioned this is a proprietary uh, double, uh, double ball nut type design, some of the things I mentioned before. Uh, smooth operation and good repeatability. So this is the, the, the different types of ball screws. Typically, you'll have a, a, your precision screws will be ground. Your less precise screws will be uh, rolled, as in you're just either heating up the material and uh, hot rolling it into position. These are actually screws that we would call world. They are machine cut, which means we get sort of uh, halfway, we meet halfway between a ground screw and a rolled screw, meaning smoother operation less noise and better precision than a rolled screw. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, more better precision than a rolled screw, closer, more closer to what you could get with a ground screw, but more at the cost of a rolled screw. Uh, we also have a patented integrated relubrication system. So what you're able to do in these units is either run the unit, the uh, screw to the back of the unit and re-grease with a fitting that is built into the end block, or we can also add a mid, uh, mid bore lubrication port where the ball nut can be lubricated with the cylinder as is in uh, mid travel. 
anti-rotation guide. These are anti-rotate type cylinders, so we're not relying on your payload to be fixed in some sort of way to keep the cylinder rod from rotating. The unit will, uh, if you put a motor on without any load and start driving the unit, the rod will move in and out without any type of rotation. Uh, these are maintenance-free polymer bushings. All the guidance options or all the guidance uh, technologies on the ETH are maintenance-free. The only unit that needs any kind of lubrication would be the screw. So I mentioned, uh, these support bearings, these are oversized angular contact bearings, meaning the angular contact bearings, which are a lower cost component than the screw, will always outlast the screw. So we're able to sort of um, maximize the life of the unit, meaning we all, all the, the ball screw itself is the only unit we need to check with life. We're able to get much better uh, <clears throat> loading than traditional, meaning we're not, we don't no longer have to sort of derate uh, the unit based on what the screw support bearings are able to handle. Now these, these units are put sort of back to back. So we're allowed to get the same amount of thrust in either extension or retraction in this case. These units are probably the highest uh, ceiling rating of any electromechanical product Parker offers. Standard out of the box will be IP54 due to the uh, lip and wiper seal on the front of the unit. What it does is keeps contaminants out of the cylinder from the process, or if you have a relatively clean process, that seal is also very good at keeping contaminants generated by the cylinder, such as lubricants or things like that, keeping them in the cylinder itself and out of your work area. I mentioned standard is IP54. We also have the option to put an upgraded seal on the end of that unit and get the unit to IP65, and we'll talk about that a little more later. I mentioned lubrication. Uh, we do have these things sort of plumbed through that end block there. You're able to take a grease fitting uh, or a funnel tip on a grease gun and lubricate the ball nut directly with the cylinder fully retracted. Now the idea, if, you, if uh, your application is one where you really can't get to that port uh, when the cylinder is fully retracted, we could put a additional port on the actual cylinder body sort of mid-travel, and that's just really just a screw cap you take out and you can get to the grease fitting on the ball nut. And that, that uh, port can be positioned pretty much anywhere along the cylinder body should you have a space constra constraint. We do offer parallel wraps on these units as well. Uh, these are important, one for saving space if you have an overall length sort of constraint, and also in a lot of uh, clevis type arc of motion applications, you'll need to wrap the motor around the side of the unit uh, and so you get room for that clevis on the back. Uh, these are what we'll call uh, Kevlar-type belts. This isn't any kind of a gear drive. So we do get a little bit of thrust deration when we go to a parallel wrap uh, type of unit. Now, the other thing you might see there, there is that what looks like a gearbox. That is uh, not a gearbox. That is an what we call the overhung load adapter. The amount of thrust the ETH is able to generate means the amount of tension that we have to put on that parallel wrap belt is uh, pretty severe. And a lot of motors, actually most motors, really don't have the radial bearings to support that kind of a side load. So we include this overhung load adapter that completely decouples belt tension from the, <clears throat> uh, from the shaft of the motor. Uh, the belt ten tensioning is done with a tensioning station. Uh, really kind of takes the guesswork out of it and things can be mounted uh, very repeatably. There's a single uh, jack screw in there that will apply tension to the parallel belt. And then there's also some uh, set screws there that you can use that will become preset from the factory if, if we're mounting that overhung load adapter or mounting a gearbox on the unit. Um, so that, you know, in the event you need to take your motor off, you need to change something, change your belt, whatever it may be. You can detension that belt, uh, do all the work you need to do, and then just retighten back up to the set screws that were in place and not even not have to worry about any kind of uh, checking any kind of tension or taking out a tension meter. So I mentioned the overhung load adapter. What this also does is simplifies motor mounting. So that unit is basically a one-to-one -one version of a Parker gearbox. Uh, and the nice thing with those Parker gearboxes is we've got thousands of pre-configured orderable motor mounting kits uh, to easily adapt pretty much any any motor on the market that fits in this sort of frame size to those units. So, you know, we're not stuck uh, 
creating tons of custom motor mounts for people. Chances are, if, you're, if your motor is of a size that will fit on this type of unit, chances are we already have a mounting kit for it. Now, in the, in the event that you do need some sort of gear reduction, uh, that one-to-one -one overhung load adapter you see there can be replaced with uh, a typical Parker gearbox with, that would have the same uh, sort of mounting features as we've already discussed. Lots of options and accessories, and we'll talk about some of these a little more as we go through some a part number configuration. Uh, but we do have some force sensors to create sort of a closed loop sort of force system bordering on the lines of something like a servo press. There's really kind of the advantage of going electromechanical in these sort of options is much uh, finer position and force control. So the ETH is available in five frame sizes. The uh, numbers after those frame sizes refers to the size of the cylinder bore. And these are ISO standards that you'll see on hydraulic cylinders as well. 32 meaning a 32 millimeter bore all the way up to a 125 millimeter bore. You can see the 30, ETH 32 is capable of a maximum thrust of about 832 pounds, whereas the ETH 125 goes the whole way up to about 25,000 pounds. Now those are absolute maxes. Those are sort of numbers not to exceed. Um, what we have below you see is the uh, rated thrust and that, that number will get you the 2540 kilometers of rated actuation that you see in, on, on all uh, Parker electromechanical products. Those numbers can be exceeded. We'll just potentially start eating into life. Now, that being said, a lot of these applications uh, tend to be relatively short stroke. Even at high duty cycle, 2540 can be a very, very long amount of life and can a lot of times can be a lot more than customers actually end up needing. You can see the max speeds uh, in excess of a, a meter per second on the 32, 50, and 80. That number does drop a bit on the 100 and 125. You know, for example, the 125, I believe, has a 64 millimeter diameter screw. That's a lot of mass uh, to be spinning around the critical speed of that screw. It does go down quite a bit just due to its size, but a screw that diameter is needed to, to get those sort of 25,000 pounds. These units will go. Um, Maximum strokes around a meter, the shortest, and up to two meters on the long on the 125. Uh, repeatability, this is uh, measured in uh, millimeters, so 30 micron bidirectional repeatability on the uh, 30 on inline type units. On uh, parallel units, we'll bump up to about 50 micron repeatability. And that's primarily because that belt does add a additional. Uh, additional bit of backlash in the system. So we were, one of, some of the things we used to tout was, you know, sort of shattering the uh, thrust barrier on some of these products. Here's an example of this. Uh, the dotted lines you see on that chart are the thrust performances at life of our legacy product, the ET. And that's what you're actually going to see a lot of uh, our competitors, a lot of ball screw uh, driven competitor actuators are still sort of postured in that sort of uh, thrust type market. You can see the ETH almost doubles in a lot of cases the amount of available thrust than some of these uh, traditional type of units. Also at a much higher life. I mentioned uh, five frame sizes from 32 millimeter bores up to 125 millimeter bores. The 32, 50, and 80 do offer uh, three different uh, drivetrain leads, as in how many millimeters of actuation per revolution of the screw. There are only two options on the uh, 100 and 125. The reason we sort of do this, we have what we'll call a fine lead and a coarse lead. The finer leads. Uh, are much uh, lower linear speed, uh, but offer a much greater uh, mechanical reduction or uh, mechanical advantage for the motor. So meaning you have some inherent gearing built into the system. They're also higher, uh, tend to be higher thrust type units as well. Uh, the coarser leads do offer you some uh, higher speeds, but the motor uh, will not see the same sort of mechanical advantage. So some gearing may be necessary.
motor mounting. This uh, the motors can be mounted in line or parallel uh, in sort of different clock orientations. And really, what it is a square body. So, um, what the clock orientations refer to is really what side is the limit or the limit switch is going to be on in relation to your motor. A lot of time that's important due to you know you might be mounting the actuator flat down onto a surface. You want to have your motor and your limit switches sort of on the same side so they can easily be gotten to for adjustments or uh, potential uh, changes if you need to change anything out. Lubrication boards we discussed already. We have the uh, integrated lubrication port, uh, which is standard on almost on every cylinder. Drive the, uh, you know, set a lubrication program in your uh, controller, run the cylinder the whole way back to the end block, butt it up against the uh, uh, the bumper in the back and be able to grease the system with a typical grease gun. The, uh, lubri uh, the center lubrication board just moves that off of the end block, which is really helpful in a lot of uh, arc of motion type applications where it might be a lot easier to get to the center of the cylinder than it is getting to the end block. Adam, we had a question come in right there in the chat on are the clock features in relation to the face mount. I believe I asked that correctly from Carl. Uh, yeah, that will that will also uh, in influence the orientation of uh, any type of mounting options you'll have. Is that? It, I'm not sure if I'm answering that correctly. He okay, perfect. replied that was good. And cool. And we'll we'll talk about the different face mounting options in a little bit here. Uh, so for motor motor mounting, these units can be ordered uh, with uh, what we call our express motor options, meaning uh, the unit will come with a motor already mounted from the factory. And these are sort of what we'll we'll recommend for if you want to do uh, just a quick and dirty type sizing. These mo these units can be sized uh, XP units can be sized entirely out of the catalog, including sizing the motor as well. Uh, we have kits for uh, for Parker motors. Uh, mounting kits for Parker gearboxes as well. A lot of these applications do require some pretty high thrust, uh, which require some pretty high torques for the motors. So some gearing might be uh, necessary to avoid having to put a massive motor on these units. And we also have um, what we'll call our non-standard motor, motor mounts, uh, which will cover a, a variety of, of motors on the market. You know, Yaskawa, Allen Bradley, Siemens, any any of the typical motors you would typically see, chances are we already have a mounting kit for it, and chances are it is already a catalog item and won't require any kind of customization. So I mentioned the express motors. Uh, what these do is maximize the power output of each frame size. So these options might not necessarily be uh, the most uh, adequately sized from, you know, they may be a bit oversized. They do include some safety factor, and you mentioned you may notice that these are sort of the largest stack length of each of those frame sizes of motors. Um, but the, this, we'll, we'll go through some uh, charts in a little bit here to show really the advantage of being able to very easily size uh, a cylinder based on just going out of the catalog using these motors. Now, if you want something a little more right size, that is always an option as well. Uh, and we can assist with that and we can pretty much mount any, mo any, uh, Parker motor or any kind of any stack length that would be right size for the application. I mentioned that as well. So mounting options, uh, variety of mounting options. We have what you know what, what are called foot mounts, and these units, uh, most of these mounting options are uh, they can be ordered separately or they can be ordered uh, configured already mounted on the unit they can be there are with the exception of the center trunnion everything on here is uh, field installable they'll either use the uh, bottom tap holes on the body so if you uh, see the cylinder or the uh, end blocks of the cylinder we'll have some drilled and tapped holes uh, in the bottom for threading into the cylinder. They also have uh, face mounting holes. So the screws that mount the end blocks onto the actuator also include uh, a female thread on the end for mounting things like that front flange and the rear flange, things along those lines. Uh, bottom tap is only available on the 32, 50, and 80. Uh, bottom tap is not available on the 100 and 125, primarily due to the amount of force that those units can generate uh, 
does not leave enough uh, sort of safety factor in those bolts from shearing off. So it's just that's really more of a, a safety and a design limitation that we're not able to offer bottom tap mounting on those units. Now we do have some uh, foot mount or side lug type mountings that will sort of emulate the same sort of mount as bottom tap, but it will utilize the uh, the front and end bolts on the cylinder, which are a, a steel thread as opposed to uh, an aluminum thread for just some much better strength. Rear clevis and trunnions, you know, those are the kind of things you're going to want to use for arc of motion type applications. Uh, clevises are a lot easier to install, but trunnions are a good bit more robust. Uh, and trunnions will also allow for either parallel or inline type mounting, whereas uh, rear eyes and rear clevises do require parallel mounting. So in a lot of high thrust applications where the duration imposed by a parallel wrap uh, isn't acceptable, we'll end up using those center trunnions. The only real disadvantage to the center trunnion is this must be uh, installed at the factory because it is a different end block and that end block does house the uh, angular contact bearings that need to be preloaded adequately. Rod end options. So a lot of different options here as well. Uh, clevis and spherical rod eye options uh, for arc of motion applications. Now, one thing to consider when you are doing an arc of motion, there's a lot of alignment uh, that go into those. We'll typically recommend using a fixed type mount on one end, which would be either a clevis, the rear eye or the trunnion, and then utilize something like a spherical rod eye on the other end to sort of decouple any kind of uh, potential misalignment. When, when you use, when you, in an arc of motion, uh, you'll have you know whatever you're moving will likely be fixed on its own hinge and using uh, two clevis mounts creates an overconstrained system, which can either cause racking on the cylinder itself or can cause racking on your whatever you're trying to move. Uh, male and female threads are available. Uh, these are going to be standard metric threads uh, for, for standard type units, but we can customize those with pretty much whatever thread uh, you could potentially need. We offer an alignment coupler as well. This is, uh, that's not for arc of motion. That is more for if you're moving something that has a pretty high tolerance range. Uh, this, that will, that unit will allow some angular misalignment between the, the axis of the cylinder and the sort of axis of motion that your payload is imposing on the system. For non-guided applications, you know, a lot of applications we see where, where the payload will be on some sort of rails. Uh, the cylinders utilized in a thrust only kind of application, which is really what these units are designed for. But in the event you do need, have some sort of offset loading, the cylinder is unguided, or you need some sort of high level of side loading or uh, some sort of torque being applied to the cylinder rod, we do offer a linear guide module. What this is, is uh, linear uh, ball bushings on steel rods. This unit bolts right onto the front of the actuator. Uh, it, it is field installable, uh, though you will lose some stroke just because of the length. Whereas if you can order it from the factory and if you specify 600 millimeters of stroke, for example, you will still get a full 600 millimeters if that unit is sized uh, for it and, and installed at the factory. So strokes, we mentioned these units are available uh, up to around two meters on the longer units and up, up between a thousand millimeters on the 32 and 1600 millimeters on the ETH 80. We have these in what we what we sort of call our preferred stroke options. What this means is, you know, we, we do make, we do sell quite a bit of these cylinders and these are the lengths that we will uh, stock pre-cut screws and extrusion bodies in uh, for quicker ship options. Now that being said, uh, a lot of times these strokes might be a little more than you need or they won't fit in your sort of space constraint. Uh, so these are also available as standards ordering in one millimeter increments. Now there are minimum strokes on these units uh, as well. And that is one limitation of that proprietary double ball nut design. Uh, anything underneath uh, 50 millimeters on the 32 and 50 and 200 millimeters on the 125 means that uh, the rolling elements will not make a full circulation through the ball nut. 
uh, and which meaning when you when you do any kind of relubrication, you are not getting lubricants all through the unit, which can cause for uh, premature screw type failures. IP rating. So those aren't aware. IP stands for uh, ingress protection. So the first number is your protection against the ingress of solids. Your second number is protection against ingress of liquid. So for example, 54. Uh, meaning sealed from solid uh, debris. There, there is a size, a particle size, as they do rate that on that I don't remember off the top of my head right now. Uh, 54, four meaning protected against sort of light, uh, light splashing. So, you know, if you have sort of indirect splashing on the unit from something like machine colon or something like that, IP54 is going to be plenty. Uh, IP65, we have a couple preps rolled into one here. 65, meaning we're basically completely sealed against ingress of any kind of dust. And five, meaning sealed against low pressure, uh, low pressure spray. You know, we're not talking high pressure wash down type applications that you would see in IP69K for uh, like meat and poultry handling. Uh, but these units are typically can be good enough even for some uh, outdoor external mobile type applications. Still not as high as like a 67 or a 69K, but uh, quite a bit higher than anything else we offer. That The 65 as standard will also come with an epoxy coating. And what we sort of done there is rolled uh, both uh, IP65 and a corrosive environment prep into one. So anytime you have any kind of environment where you'll have chemicals that are corrosive or caustic to anodized aluminum, you'll want to use that epoxy coated option. If you only need the sealing, that's fine as well. We can just use the seals and uh, forego any kind of epoxy coating. The problem with epoxy coating is you know, the unit is, is fully built and then is sent out for coating, meaning everything is sealed and really nothing can be removed or serviced at that point. So if you don't need, if you don't have a caustic environment and don't need the coating, we typically recommend to go without it. It will save some cost. Let's talk for a minute about sizing, what we actually need to do to go through and select one of these products. Uh, obviously, you're going to need to know your required force. And typically, we'll say we want to know what sort of force you need at different segments in your move. Now, this can be a bit of a departure from the way that a lot of hydraulic systems are sized, which is basically give me a linear speed and give me your max force so we can go from there. You, you can do that on these type of cylinders, but what you end up doing a lot of times is oversizing. So we, we really never want to size based off of peak force. We want to know sort of what are the forces you need at the different segments in your move. We're going to use that to back work the root mean squared force. That's what actually goes into your life calculation. Uh, as for move, uh, we really prefer to figure out what the distance is. Start with something like a cycle time. You know, the amount of, the amount of distance you need to move and how much time do you have to do it as opposed to just going off of a speed. You know, what, what, for example, one meter in one second does not equal you having a speed of one meter a second. We need this to factor in acceleration. And if we have the distance and the time, what we can do is actually play some games with varying our acceleration rate or figuring out what our acceleration rate should be to either keep the linear speed a little bit lower or potentially go have the speed a little bit higher and keep the acceleration lower uh, which will actually end up affecting your motor sizing as well uh, side load really only need to know this if we're in a non-guided or a non-pure thrust type application so you know for example in an arc of motion application uh, you know, if you've ever done the statics and the physics on one of those, those are uh, fully pure thrust type applications. We don't need to worry about side load. Uh, side load, it can be a little non-trivial to calculate. Uh, so what we do include uh, some charts in the catalog, basically saying, what's your, what's your stroke? Here's your maximum side load. I mentioned the, uh, the thrust curves for express motors. What this sort of allows allows you to do is, you know, figure out what is the amount of thrust I'm using, how much speed do I need. We can come to this chart and figure out is that going to be acceptable for. In the green, that's what we'll call a continuous duty, 100% duty cycle. Uh, up in yellow, that's sort of the intermittent range. So you know, if we have you know like a say like a 50% duty cycle or so, we can 
potentially operate up in that yellow range. What this chart means, if you can find uh, find your your point on that chart, if you're falling uh, in any of these areas, you're, you'll be able to select the cylinder with those one of those express motors we mentioned before, and that's that's it. You're done. You don't need to do any really further sizing. Now, if you're not using an express motor, what we do have here are sort of the hybrid speed thrust wraps. So you can figure out here's the amount of thrust I need and also how much speed you're looking at in uh, millimeters a second. Again, sort of simplifying some of the things I mentioned before. You will potentially oversize using some of this stuff, but if you're looking for sort of a quick, let's get up and running speed kind of calculation, a lot of machine builders, everything is really about speed. Let's get it done quickly. Let's get product in house and ship the machine. Uh, a lot of times they do, they don't necessarily care about oversizing. They want things to be a little bit oversized uh, so that they're eliminating any chance of downtime and able to ensure that the system is gonna operate as designed for quite a long time. Uh, this chart will also tell you, uh, give you an idea of what your motor torque is going to need to be so you can make a better idea of uh, specifying what you need from a motor. And you see at the top here, we do also specify at, depending on uh, what lead, you see these charts are size and lead dependent. Knowing your application details, your thrust and your linear speed, you're able to figure out what rotational speed you need on the motor and what sort of torques. So you could they take this directly and compare it to a motor performance curve. Let's talk about some potential applications. Um, these units excel in thrusting apps. Any place you would have put a sort of medium duty hydraulic cylinder or a pneumatic rotted cylinder, you can put one of these units no problem and get some, some better control as well. Um, reach and retract, so these units inherently are telescoping. So you're able to uh, reach into your work area and then retract from your work area while you have other things going on. Also ideal for fluid power uh, conversion type applications. So some advantage over typical fluid power cylinders, much higher level of control. You know, we're able to program positions and move profiles. So we know exactly what our accelerations are going to be. We can operate a little more on the edge, pushing sort of right up to what the application details need to be, not really having to guess at are we actually you know, getting the speed that we're specifying. Uh, compact power supply, you're looking at, you know, typically, uh, you know, you don't have a large hydraulic power unit sitting anywhere. You don't need to worry about hydraulic lines, any type of fluid spilling. And typically for your uh, hydraulic power unit, you're going to have a large VFD uh, to run the motor on your pump. The drive uh, for that servo motor will be able to fit most likely in the same same kind of space that that uh, HPU VFD was sitting in. So you're really, you're, you're not necessarily saving much uh, in your electrical cabinet, but you're saving a ton of floor space by not needing to have a uh, compressor or a pump sitting anywhere. These sort of units, when we talk about fluid power conversion, you know, we're not talking the 100 to 300 ton presses that you see in a lot of places. That's just really not what these things are designed for. And uh, electric actuation can get pretty cost prohibitive at those sort of units. What we're talking about is the 70 bar or 1000 PSI uh, type applications. So you can see for just uh, general ideas on the, uh, at a 100 and a 125 ISO bore size that a 70 bar or 1000 PSI will get you on a, on a 100 about about 55 kilonewtons of thrust, whereas an electric cylinder will get you around 56. Just a, an idea, not, not, not using that as a look, electric is better from a thrust perspective, not necessarily, but we are able to compete in the 70 bar to a, or and 1000 PSI type hydraulic market, sort of what we call medium duty. High, uh, heavy duty hydraulics uh, are still kind of not really where you wanna be considering electric yet, just due to things like cost. So primary markets, we use a ton of these in automotive, uh, including tire and rubber. Uh, food packaging and processing, we see a lot of these units, primarily because of the uh, clean body type design I mentioned before, and the higher uh, sealing. A lot of uh, food and beverage type applications require higher levels of sealing. One, because you want to make sure 
you're not getting contaminants into food and because you do need to be able to clean these units and they do need to be able to stand up to that uh, heavy type of cleaning. Same thing with packaging machinery, that sort of also jumps in with, uh, with food and beverage. Uh, aerospace, if you've seen any kind of uh, simulators, hexapod types uh, simulators where you know the, we're trying to emulate what sort of forces and orientation the pilot would feel in the air. We've put a lot of ETH units into those kind of applications and they're really ideal for those kind of applications because we can get much better degrees of coordinated motion than you can with fluid power. Uh, push to force, you know, we've got servo motors on these units. We're able to really create the servo loop around force, creating sort of what we mentioned about a servo press, you know, two benders. We've done a lot of those as well. Uh, you know, clamping assembly fixtures too are, are a, a lot of um, work holding and machine tools. We've seen a lot of these units there and those types of things as well. And here's an example we mentioned. Uh, using these in sort of reach in reach out applications. Here's an example where we're using a rotted cylinder with a rod guide in a uh, gantry type application, being able to put, reach in and out of the work area, moving in and out. Uh, I did see that one question come through, very good question. Uh, these units are also available with ATEX explosion proof ratings. So if you have, uh, it's an, I believe it's an ATEX uh, class, to, and I'm sorry, I remember, don't remember the designation off the top of my head, but it is uh, rated in uh, explosive gas type environments. So we do use these units quite a bit in things like oil and gas and chemical processing. Uh, ATEX ratings, uh, as you can probably uh, imagine, can get uh, pretty difficult. There's a lot of stuff to consider. So, you know, we do will require a lot of additional detail from you at that point. But we're able to supply an ATEX rated ETH cylinder. Uh, a lot of people realize, you know, don't realize the ETH itself, when you're purchasing, say you're purchasing it without a motor, that unit will still require a uh, ATEX rating. Any kind of mechanical actuator is a heat generating item. Uh, so ATEX ratings are required. We also do have EX, what's called the EX series explosion proof servo motor that we can pair with this actuator as well to create a uh, a full ATEX rated solution. So if, yeah, if, if anybody has any of those, that's not something you can order as a standard. They said there's a lot of stuff we need to look into when those come around, but yeah, definitely reach out. It is a capability we have. Yeah, so here's another example. We've used these a lot before in uh, uh, test type fixtures. Uh, you see, this is an automotive test where we're testing the actuation force of uh, some switches in in automotive you know i mentioned uh this is this is a real application this is a picture of a customer's device obviously used with their permission uh this is a what's called a hexapod uh used in a simulator for the uh for training for i believe for the u.s military this is sort of oops come on video there we go not sure if the video is going to work, but this is sort of what I call the the cool ETH application. Uh, a lot of these these are used in uh, entertainment and uh, performance type situations. So this uh, doesn't look like the video is going to work today, but this was used at uh, you know some of those mega concerts that they'll you know they'll spend three days setting up for at football stadiums. Uh, these were moving up up and down uh, you know from horizontal to vertical. These uh, thirty foot tall platforms that people like uh, Cirque du Soleil or something might use. Uh, these, these kind of guys love these electric type actuation because one, they're not stuck hauling around hydraulic power units. They don't need to worry about hooking up hydraulic lines. And uh, a lot of these concerts and things are, you know, they're outdoor. Uh, they do need to worry about EPA regulations on what they need to do if there's a hydraulics bill. In this case, it's plug in your, cab plug in your cables and you're done. Ease of setup and tear down. There's, uh, we've we've sold a lot of ETHs into the entertainment industry. Uh, here's an idea we we uh, did for another customer a uh, precision pump. So what you see there is actually it's a Parker uh, hydraulic cylinder being used in fluid dosing with an ETH on the back to get uh, better control. So a lot of uh, the food and beverage industry 
will actually end up overfilling a lot of their containers uh, due to, you know, if they they publish the weights on the container, if the weight is uh, the amount of product in the container is under, they do open themselves up to lawsuits. There's been plenty of lawsuits over the years where, you know, a container said it contained five ounces, it only contained 4.5. So just to mitigate that, uh, they will overfill because a lot of these units, you know, as as a lot of food products as things potentially dry out the weight goes down so they will overfill but they want to make sure they're accurately overfilling because overfilled uh, containers means uh, potentially you're wasting a, you're potentially wasting money if you're overfilling your overfill so we've done a lot of uh, precision dosing type applications uh, here's another example this was uh, for Packaged pepperoni, uh, the same sort of thing. And that unit you see there, that is the IP65 epoxy coated cylinder. They did go with that in this case uh, due to uh, this being kind of a wash down. Now, again, this is not a full IP69K AAA FDA rated kind of unit. This was uh, at this point, you know, food is prepared. We're not dealing with raw meat. So we're not dealing with high temperature, high pressure wash down, which is really not what these units are for. This is not IP69K. Uh, but in these kind of applications, the 65 with 65 sealing and coating is more than adequate. So just uh, talk real quick about some uh, competitive alignment. You can see these, uh, the blue chart is the maximum thrust force of our legacy product, the ET, which is primarily what uh, the rest of the market is still uh, still competing with. You can see the the 32s, maybe up through the 125s, are around double, if not more, thrust density. What this means, you know, if you do come up against a uh, competitor cylinder, you try want to try to displace it, or you need to potentially resize. We're most likely going to be able to put a smaller frame size in than some of those competitor units, which uh, can make conversion a lot easier and uh, can potentially save a lot of room in your machines. You know, a lot of OEM type machines, everything. Uh, everything comes down to envelope size, right? Mar their uh, marketing departments come up with how much space they have for the application or how much, uh, how big the piece of the equipment can potentially be for the market to accept it. So a lot of times uh, being able to be right sized and save as much space as possible really is key. Again, mentioning with ET, just some more uh, charts showing you some of those thrust details. So I mentioned, you know, the competitors are really, it's kind of a uh, step behind. They're still in the force classes of uh, of the ET, which is, again, m many times smaller than the ETH. Uh, this is really, again, due to the oversized ball nut and the uh, proprietary nature of it, we don't have a lot of dead space in that ball nut. There's not a lot of space for things that aren't actually generating force. There's uh, me meaning all of that dead space is able to be used to add either more rolling elements or a larger diameter screw to get much better thrust performance. Where things really come in, um, where, or where the ETH is kind of postured to compete is against uh, packaged roller screw cylinders. So for those who aren't aware, roller screws, uh, there, it's a relatively new screw technology, a planetary uh, type roller screw, where as opposed to taking a uh, screw form and putting rolling ball bearings around it that recirculate. What you do is you wrap uh, planetary rollers around the screw. And if if I have two equally sized screws, one is a ball screw and one is a roller screw, the roller screw is going to outcompete every single time. Uh, just we have line contact uh, in a roller screw versus point contact with the elements in a ball screw, uh, meaning the roller screw one has a lot more uh, force area. It's a lot, lot higher stress area in the same amount of space, and it is able to take things like rougher duty impact loading. You know, ball screws do not fare well against impact loading. That being said, uh, the way we've sort of sized these units and the way we've designed those screws to sort of maximize the amount of screw we can put into a size bore means we're able to compete uh, with and be pretty much equal thrust or higher thrust on a lot of roller screw type applications in the same sort of size. Primary advantage here with sticking with a ball screw if you can is roller screws are expensive. You know, they're difficult to manufacture. You know, a lot of times the screw itself can be six plus months lead time. Uh, there's only a handful of manufacturers in the world that make these things. Um, 
but you know you, you can see as and the, the primary advantage again if you have impact type loading you're going to need a roller screw or like short quick moves where things can't uh, won't be able to recirculate on a ball screw roller screws will be superior there uh but in a sort of tip if you take all that away you don't have an application that requires that you, know, you can use the same mechanical wear equation for uh roll screw and ball screws same l10 life and you you will be able to calculate and see that these products can potentially and for packaged actuators of the same size uh, the numbers don't lie these products can be basically interchangeable that being said, uh, we do also offer a roller screw product. This is the XFC, the uh, Parker Extreme Force Cylinder. Uh, this unit sort of begins in thrust where the ETH stops. So if the ETH goes up to 125 millimeter bore size. The XFC goes up to a 190 millimeter uh, bore size. We kind of keep this product as a, we'll call it a last resort. Everything I mentioned about roller screws, long lead times, higher prices, is definitely apparent when you start looking at these units. So again, we will sort of save these for when we need when we need sort of forces that the ETH isn't capable of generating. So it is an all steel construction. Uh, it's a tie rod type cylinder. The amount of the forces uh, that these units are able to generate would rip the end blocks right off of an aluminum uh, type cylinder without tie rods. Uh, Again, this and then this is really meant to be sort of a direct drop in uh, for heavy duty type hydraulics. So the tie rod design and round uh, steel bore is kind of what that market is looking for. Again, rollers six frame sizes. So there is some overlap with the ETH line, uh, primarily for things I mentioned before, like short, quick moves and impact loading. Uh, the main differentiators are this again, this unit uses a planetary roller screw and as a uh, when it comes to a parallel wrap, we're no longer using a uh, polymer Kevlar belt for that wrap. This is now a, a steel gear type wrap. And the high, the XFC 190 will get you about 80,000 pounds of max force. So, you know, almost 4x what the largest ETH is able to do. Again, these can kind of be niche products. I mentioned these uh, these units are considerably more costly than the ETH. Um, typically they will be used in areas where hydraulics just flat out cannot be used. We have, you have applications that cannot tolerate oil, cannot tolerate having a large hydraulic power unit. This is where you would consider something like the XFC, uh, but just be aware again, they are higher lead time and they are much higher priced. High capacity nuts and oversized angular contact bearings, similar to what we did in the ETH, though, uh, if you might have seen in this cross section here, the XFC utilizes four angular contact bearings as opposed to the two in the ETH. Again, primarily just because of the amount of force that unit is able to generate. If we were to put two angular contact bearings on it, those bearings would be larger than the cylinder itself. So we've gone with four to try to keep the size down. So the, the steel body uh, means you know, these things are uh, very stiff and leak free as well. So these typically will be still be an oil an oil filled type unit, oil bath, uh, just because of the nature of uh, of cylindrical rollers. They are not recirculating. It's harder to circulate lubricants through them. So we'll do a grease filled or an oil filled type solution. But the seals on these units do mean uh, you won't have any kind of leakage. Good question on the um, on the uh, XFC versus the EHA. So the XFC has uh, higher strokes and some higher forces than the EHA. Uh, the EHA, uh, yeah, rough <laughs> rough rough pricing. Will uh, yeah, the EHA might be I want to say a couple hundred dollars to maybe a grand or fifteen hundred. XFCs, you're looking. We we sort of joke that the price of an XFC is about a dollar per pound of thrust. And unfortunately, that really isn't isn't a joke. Of the largest XFC 190 at its highest thrust is going to be around uh, forty thousand dollars, and most of that is is just the cost of the screw. The uh, this is manufactured by a cylinder division, though the same division that manufactures the uh, EHA. Same sort of ISO tie rod design. Uh, as before, but again, this is again, this is really what I would call a niche product. I would never go into an application and lead with this product 
because of, again, the things I just mentioned, the price <laughs> being number one, but there are some applications where hydraulics just can't be used, where we have used these a lot. You know, these are used um, in some military uh, type applications, uh, as well as, again, in the entertainment industry, there are some very high force type applications there where uh, hydraulic power units can't be used. So again, when to consider, uh, you only want to consider this in high impact forces and forces higher than the ETH 125 and when just the concept of hydraulics really can't, aren't acceptable in the application. The ETH does have some higher speeds than the XFC due to the larger uh, screw leads and the XFC is higher cost than the ETH. Still a, a good solution when you need it, but if at all possible, we try to stick with the ETH. That's what I have prepared. Are there any uh, questions, some questions I may have missed? All right. Thank you, Adam. There, there were a couple of questions, uh, some typical ones that always come in uh, via the chat. Uh, where are the ETH manufactured and what would be a, an average lead time? Yeah, so the ETH is a uh, Parker Global product, so it is manufactured in multiple areas around the world. Uh, the 32, 50, and 80 for the U.S. market are manufactured in Irwin, Pennsylvania, where I'm based, right outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, the 100 and the 125s, those are manufactured in Germany, primarily due to their, their size and their weight. You know, 64 millimeter diameter ball screw is not a light unit by any means. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're just not necessarily equipped uh, for that heavy type of manufacturing like Germany is. Those uh, the larger 100 and 125 uh, typical typical lead times in the eight to ten week range. Uh, the 32, 50, and 80 can be uh, more in the in the four to six, four to six on a bad day, uh, three to four on a good day. Okay. Oh, we just had another question come in. What is the purpose of the home and travel sensors, and are the motors not off of an encoder? The motors are off of an encoder. Uh, so <clears throat> limit switches are kind of one of those things. Some people use them, some people don't. Um, in the case of an ETH, uh, a lot of people, li limits aren't as popular. So people will either use absolute encoders or they will still use an incremental encoder and they will just do a uh, home to hard stop type situation. Now that, that being said, a, a lot of applications will still require end of travel limits, like for example, anything in uh, medical <clears throat> requires payload mounted feedback limits and position verification. So we do offer that as an option, but um, in a lot of applications, no, people are just flat out aren't gonna use homes or limits anymore. They're gonna home to a hard stop or they're gonna use an absolute encoder where you'll set your zero position once. And as long as you don't take the motor off of the unit and rotate the motor, or change any position, even in a power down and a power up, you're still gonna know exactly where you are. But lim limit switches are still kind of a sort of legacy item that a lot of people still require, so we do still offer it. But I venture to say 10 years from now with <clears throat> uh, advances in absolute technology and uh, advances in uh, servo drive technology, we'll see less and less of uh, end of travel and home sensors being utilized. Because again, they're, they're an additional item. They're an additional point of potential failure. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just a quick note in the materials section of the control panel, I did upload the ETH and uh, XFC catalog. So if you want to grab that before you log off today, uh, that's available there. And there's also a link to parkermotion.com. That would be the website where uh, Parker Electromechanical Division houses a lot of their information that's available online. Also, a quick reminder, if you have questions after this, feel free to reach out to your Kundinger contacts. If you don't know who that is, you can reach us at sales at .com or call into our 800 number at 800-242-4811. And to stay up to date on future Cundinger Presents presentations, we'd ask you to follow us on LinkedIn. 
I want to thank Adam for your time today and walking us through this and also thank all of the participants for joining us today. We look forward to having you on a future Cunninger Presents presentation. Thank you, everybody.